All right, please have your Bibles out to 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16, lesson 22, King David flees. So, last time, Absalom, his son, declared that he was king in Hebron. David got the word and he knew he had to flee. It was also to see who was faithful to him, who was on his side. Because they would, and only they would go with him. We saw that David, uh, when he left Jerusalem, left it empty. Left some, I mean, not completely empty, but his people. He left some of his concubines there. Absalom made his way down there to get into the city. Some people went with David Ittai, the Gittite. He told him, go back. You have, you're, you're a fresh new Christian. Absalom won't suspect you of anything. And then he told his wise man, Hushai, Hushai, go back and defeat the wise counsel of Ahithophel. Ahithophel will give my son Absalom wise counsel. You need to be there to confuse, to uh, confuse that wise advice, and you do something different. So that's where we left off. So David, you can imagine with his people, and him being old, they're not going to be able to travel very far. They're going to become tired quickly. They're going to need to rest. And that's where we'll see over this lesson and the next lesson the importance of David sending back Hushai. Okay? So they probably needed rest. They're at some resting place. And that's where we're going to join up David here. Okay? At the top of a hill. Verse uh, 1 of Second chap- Samuel chapter 16. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled, and upon them two hundred loaves, and a hundred bunches of raisins, and a hundred of summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine, that such as be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, Where is thy master's son? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem, for he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of all my father. Then said the king to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertaineth to Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. If you remember, David, having vowed to Jonathan to take care of his family, David realizing he hadn't done or checked on anything, we know a few lessons ago, he had gone out and he had contacted others. He had found Ziba, a former servant of Saul's, and went to him and said, is there any left in the house of Saul that I can still care for? Sure enough, said Ziba, Mephibosheth, the lame son of Jonathan. Well, David's heart was thrilled with joy because here he could help this man, Mephibosheth. So all of the lands of Saul were restored to Mephibosheth. They were his. Now the problem is, Mephibosheth is lame. He probably he couldn't get out there and take care of the things. So David took Mephibosheth and said, Mephibosheth, you can stay here in my palace and eat from the king's table. You will be treated like a prince. Ziba, you go back and you take care of the lands of Saul for Mephibosheth. You make sure that they prosper. You make the decisions and take care of it. Life had been going wonderfully that way. Ziba probably was prospering in his job as caretaker of the lands. Mephibosheth was treated as a prince in the house of David. Well, now that it's time for David to flee, it would make very much sense that Mephibosheth would not flee with him. He's lame. First of all, he can't move himself. He would hinder David from fleeing. So Mephibosheth, most likely stayed back at the palace. Had to have. He wasn't here with David for sure. We, read, we don't read. And so David, while he's fleeing, finds this hill. And lo and behold, it's in the area where Ziba is taking care of Saul's and Mephibosheth's land. Now, what happens? Well, Ziba is an opportunist. He sees when other men are hurting He sees when other men are down, and he goes in for the kill, as we would say. He goes in to take advantage. You see, when there's chaos, 
When things are disorganized and disorderly, that's the perfect time to go in and take advantage of the situation. That's what Ziba does here. He knows that David is probably not thinking clearly. And so he tells a big, huge lie. What is his lie here? He says to David, David, why have I brought all you these things? Well, I brought all these blessings, because he brought what? We see fruits and wine and raisins and bread and food and asses that they could run. I brought them all for you, David, so that you could use them to escape. I knew you would need to escape, so I brought them to you. Ziba is doing nothing other than trying to impress David, trying to butter him up so that he can gain something for his advantage. That's what Ziba does here. It works. It impresses David. Oh, well, thank you. Now, now some of the old women won't have to walk. They can ride on the asses of the young children. And we, can, we now have provisions. We now have food. We won't go hungry. Well, thank you, Ziba. And then Ziba now seizing the opportunity to take advantage of David. What does Ziba do? He says, my Lord, sadly I must say that Mephibosheth has remained in Jerusalem because he thinks that Absalom is going to be the new king and he is on Absalom's side. Because he says, today shall the house of Israel restore the kingdom of my father. He thinks that he is going to be the new king. That's why Mephibosheth stayed behind. Not because he couldn't go with you. He stayed behind because he is going to be the next king, he thinks. Well, David, hearing that, is probably saddened and thinking, well, now when I get back, I'm going to take care of this. Or if I get back, I'll take care of this. Meanwhile, he awards to Ziba. He says, Ziba, why don't you? You now can be the right rightful and proper owner of all of Saul's lands. Well, that's exactly what Ziba wanted. He was trying to get his way and weasel his way into all these lands. I can wholeheartedly imagine Ziba, when he overlooked all of these lands, was he slowly, instead of sending all the money to Mephibosheth's family, was he taking and pocketing a little bit more for himself than he should have? Maybe he took a few extra cattle that were born and put them in his farm or pen. He maybe took a little wheat from Mephibosheth and put it in his barn, more than what he should have. Because that's the kind of man we see Ziba to see here, a man of opportunity. So David promises all the land to Ziba. He got what he wanted, the land of Mephibosheth. It's sad. That's one man who sees an opportunity. The next man in our lesson also sees an opportunity. His name is Shimei. Let's read about him in verse 5. When King David came to Bahurim, Behold, thence came out a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, so another man from Saul's family, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. In other words, he was shouting out curses. And he cast stones at David and, all the ser- and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. In other words, they were protecting David. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Those are the words of Shimei. Verse 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse the Lord my king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said unto Abishai and to all sinners, Behold, my son which came forth of my bowels seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him. In other words, the Lord told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction, and that the Lord will requite me this day, requite me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him, and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him, and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary, and refreshed themselves there. This is another interesting. Here's another man who takes advantage of an opportunity. David is fleeing, right? He's running away. We could imagine someone being in a fight or something, and as they're fleeing, what do we like to do? You know, maybe even sadly it might happen on the playground or somewhere else. And someone's not winning and they leave and they walk away. They're, they're down in the dumps. They're kind of, things are going away. What do we do? We holler at the, after them. Yeah, see you later, quicker. 
Adios! That's sin. And that's exactly what Shimei is doing here. Ha! Ah, David, get out of here! You see, Shimei was also a descendant of Saul. And he was probably an angry descendant of Saul. He probably felt that his family, Saul's family, should still be on the throne. But he would never have dared voice it before because David was king. And one would not speak against the king for threat of being imprisoned or put to death. But now, here's Shimei's opportunity. Also, now he's bold. Why? Because he thinks David is going to be destroyed and he's fleeing. And that Absalom will reign in his So he, he curses them all those, all those words. You're a, you're a bloody man, David, because you killed the house of Saul. It's your responsibility. You did it. Okay? He throws stones at them trying to hurt them. He's laughing at them, kind of saying, Adios, see ya, get out of here. Chucking rocks and saying all kinds of words at them. Really, again, this is the devil working here. The devil wants to destroy David because if he destroys David, he destroys the line of Christ. Well, some of David's men become upset and they say, David, why don't you let us go take care of this guy? Let's go cut off his head. Let's destroy him. And David's answer is pretty surprising. And that's why we read what we did for devotions there earlier. We saw how David looked at his own self, his own sins, and said, Lord, I deserve to be miserable. I deserve to be punished. Tear me apart, Lord. And David confesses the same thing here to his men. He says, look, look, let him curse. The Lord is in control of all things. The Lord hath, in fact, in his providential wisdom, determined that Shimei would curse me. And maybe Maybe this cursing will work out for the good of me. I will learn a lesson. Remember, David had been told that these things would happen because of his sins that he had done in the past. He knew that he deserved it. God, in his decree, used the tongue of Shimei to punish David. And David admits that. He humbles himself before the Lord and realizes that. We see that here. Okay? Now, when we are trying to be mean to someone, when we're trying to irk someone, get them all upset, when we get them all upset, that's usually when we stop bothering them, and that's when we give ourselves a little chuckle sinfully, right? That's what we do. Oh, I'll make that person miserable. I'll just keep saying, saying, saying something until finally they snap and they do something, and I'll stop saying it, but I'll laugh at them. Or I'll get them in trouble. That's sin. That's wickedness. And that's what Shimei is hoping here. He's hoping that David will react. Well, David doesn't react. David continues marching on his way, and it only makes Shimei hotter and hotter. And we can imagine Shimei walking somewhere a few distance off, away from the men, and continuing to hurl rocks and continuing to hurl insults. But David doesn't let it bother him. David doesn't let it bother him. That's pretty powerful, because we know, we might say that words don't hurt us, but they do. We have to admit, they do. Okay? And so, here we see that must come at some point that Shimei leaves them or they reach a distance where Shimei doesn't follow them any further or they reach a resting place and Shimei is done. That's what we read there. Let's see at verse 15. Though. Now we're going to jump back to Absalom. We're going to leave David and his people resting here in a different place. And Absalom is now going to be in Jerusalem meeting with uh, Hushai and Ahithophel. And we'll see something interesting here. Verse 15. And Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel with him. And it came to pass, when Hushai the archite, David's friend, was come unto Absalom, that Hushai said unto Absalom, God save the king! God save the king! And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this thy kindness to thy friend? Why wentest thou not with thy friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, Nay, but whom the Lord and this people and all the men of Israel choose, his will... I be, his will I be, and with him will I abide. And again, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? As I have served in the presence, in thy father's presence, so will I be in thy presence. We have to stop there. Did Hushai just lie? What did he do? We remember last time that probably Hushai running back from David and his group, probably arrived at Jerusalem about the same time that Absalom did. Okay. These words here are interesting what we call double speak or double talk. In other words, they're meant to impress a person a certain way, but they really mean a different thing. So we 
We do that wickedly and sinfully. When mom and dad say, will you do this? And we say yes, but we don't mean it. We, mean, we, we answer their questions so that they think that we're going to do it, but really in the back of our minds is a different intention. That's deception. That's wrong. It's still a lie. You might say, well, I didn't tell a lie. I told you yes. But you meant to deceive. And it's the heart that the sin is born in. I don't have to murder someone to commit the sin of murder. I just need to hate them in my heart. Deception. That's what's going on here. So, what happens? Well, Absalom wants to know, are you loyal to me or are you loyal to a king? And he says, long live the king! God save the king! Well, what did Hushai mean? God save, God save King David. Long live King David. Absalom thinking, "Oh, oh, he's talking about me. He's talking about me. Well, how great is this? He wants me to live long, and, and God save me, the king, King Absalom. Oh, Hushai is on my side. And then he asked him, well, how could you, how could you be a traitor to your friend, Frank, my, my father? And Hushai answered with some more double speak. Well, he says, I'll be loyal to whomever, to whomever uh, Israel chooses and, God, and Jehovah chooses. I'll stay with him and be like, well, of course, God has chosen David. But Absalom thinks, oh, God has chosen me. Well, of course, he's talking about me again. Oh, You see what happens when we become so filled with pride, we only think about ourselves. We think, oh, all these people like this. They think it's great. Oh, they love me. When in reality, they don't. They're putting up with you, but they don't really love you. Okay? We need to be careful of that. All right, so Hushai uses some doublespeak, which is deception, which are lies. Starting at verse 20, though, we want to continue on to the end of the chapter here. And then, Absal- then said Absalom to Ahithophel, Give counsel among you what we should do. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go into thy father's concubines, which ye have left to keep in the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou hast, all Israel shall hear that thou have abhorred of thy father, and then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. So that's the first bit of advice that Absalom gives, or Ahithophel gives. Absalom, if you want to be the king, the first thing you need to do is go into your father's concubines. Live with them, his, your, your father's concubines. And when all the people of Israel see it, that's a sign. That's a sign that you are the new king. In fact, let's not do it discreetly. Let's put a tent on top of the king's palace, probably somewhere maybe where David had been looking down at Bathsheba, because remember, the palace is up on top of the hill, so everybody in the city can see. Put a tent up on top of the, of the palace, and there commune with thy father's concubines. All those ten wives that David had left behind, those concubines, live with them, and all the people will all of a sudden know, oh, Oh, Absalom means business here. He's now taking the concubines of his father for himself. He intends to be king. Ahithophel was a wise man. It says right there at the end, Ahithophel was as a man who inquired at the oracle of God. He was so brilliant a counselor. It was as though he had spoken to God, that God had given him this advice. That's how good Ahithophel was. That's why David knew Hushai had to go back and confuse So what is the rest of Ahithophel's advice? How are we going to stop David? How are we going to destroy him? Because his his son wants to kill him. Chapter 17, the first few verses here. Please follow along in your Bibles. 17, verse 1. Moreover, so this is more advice of Ahithophel. Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night, and I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid, and all the people that are with him shall flee and I will smite the king only, and I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned, so all the people shall be in peace. And the saying pleased Absalom well, and all the elders of Israel. What is the wise advice? Ahithophel says this, Absalom, let me take 12,000 men, 12,000 soldiers, and we're going to get on a real fast march. In fact, we're going to march straight through the night. We're going to march after David and catch him before he can get away. Because he must be tired. He couldn't have made it that far. He's an old man. And so are the men with him. They couldn't have made it that far. 
Eh? We'll be able to attack him yet this very night if we can march very quickly through the night. So let's not take a lot of weapons with us. Let's make it a quick, light march. We'll surprise them while they're weary. 15,000 soldiers will greatly, or 12,000 soldiers will greatly outnumber David's soldiers. They won't be organized yet because they're still probably resting and they aren't in any battle arraignments and the surprise attack would cause them to panic and fall apart. And this, Ahithophel says, Absalom, I will only allow my soldiers to kill David. All the other men, those 12,000 other, or those however many other men that David has with him, we want those men to come back and be on our side, right? Those are wise, good fighters. We want them on our side. So if we destroy David, they have no choice then but to be on our side. Let us go, and I will order that only David be put to death. Don't fight the other men to the death. Only David. Unless maybe we have to kill a few bodyguards to get to him, he's probably thinking. That is excellent advice on the part of Ahithophel. That is the wisest advice. I've been. Ahithophel was exactly right. That is exactly what Absalom should do. But remember, God is in control here. Even if Ahithophel's vice advice had been followed, God still would have made sure that David would have the victory. That's what's sad about Hushai lying and being deceptive, is once again he shows, I don't trust in the Lord, I've got to come up with my own ways to try to defeat the advice of Ahithophel. So, good advice. We'll see next time if Absalom listens to it or if Hushai can uh, defeat this advice. So, Ahithophel's advice, it's good. Okay? But God is with David. God will have the victory no matter whose advice Absalom listens to. But we'll see what happens in our next lesson there.